great. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about prosthetic joint infections and other orthopedic infections with a review of the literature. Uh, before we jump into orthopedics, this is a picture of orthopedics from many, many years ago, which was amputation. And then uh, several hundred years ago, a famous quote was, he is a good surgeon who can amputate, he is a better surgeon who can save a limb. So we've come a long way since then. And then uh, whenever you're talking about prosthetic infections of any type, you have to mention about this guy who's the father of modern day uh, infection control and his name is Ignaz Semmelweis in Austria and he did the famous study where he found that the medical student service delivery of babies the mothers were dying of purpureal sepsis at 10 percent which was one out of ten women dying and the midwife was three percent which was the acceptable number so uh, he figured out they were transmitting something from the autopsy table to the women and back and forth because germs were not known at this time so he does an intervention which was hand washing um, and then if you think the soap is bad on your hands now he was using carbolic acid and this is what it looked like and you can clearly see from his epidemiological study the mortality rate dropped dramatically after the month of May when he in his intervention began so you would think they would have um, promoted him and given him all kinds of accolades and it turns out they um, fired him, kicked him out of the hospital, said he was crazy and he dies several years later in an insane asylum and rapidly aged as you can see there. So um, now we're into the high-tech age of hand washing and if you don't hand wash there's cameras watching you so we're trying to promote um, a hand hygiene uh, also be aware of places on your hands that you frequently will miss by doing a quick hand washing job and then um, this was a very interesting uh, commentary by Kent Sepkowitz at Memorial Sloan Kettering why doesn't hand hygiene work better and he even uh, quotes our beloved Semmelweis and he basically you know says that there's more to infection control than just hand washing so um, when we think of infections and in surgical site infections uh, you need to remember that if it's an abscess draining the abscess may be curative without antibiotics and on the other spectrum cellulitis where there's nothing to drain require antibiotics and then you have everything sort of in between which may require a combination of the two so let's go over the main topic with that background remember that prosthetic joint infections make up a small proportion of joint recipients uh, they cause pain reoperation loss of the prosthesis and occasionally loss of limb or life uh, the economic burden is such that fifty to sixty thousand dollars is required to treat a prosthetic joint infection if you want to know the statistics, if you have a knee replacement, your risk is 1 to 2 percent. A hip is 0.3 to 1.3 percent. A shoulder is less than 1 percent. However, if you've had revision procedures, then it jumps up to 3 percent for hips and 6 percent for knees. And if you need a joint replacement for rheumatoid arthritis, your infection rate is twice that of osteoarthritis. Now, this was from the New England Journal of Medicine on the economic impact with joint infections. And they quote how many have been infected, how many were placed, and they quoted a $30,000 number. Now, um, you can categorize joint infections into the time frame published in New England Journal of Medicine. Early onset, less than three months, delayed onset, three to 12 months, and late onset, more than 12 months. For early onset, usually acquired during the implantation, often due to virulent bacteria such as Staph aureus, gram negatives, anaerobes, mixed infections. Delayed onset can be due to contamination at implantation with 
a less virulent, more indolent presentation, and that's where coag negative staph and enterococcus dominate. And then if it's a late onset, it's usually hematogenous seeding of staph aureus, beta hemolytic strep, and gram negative bacilli. So what are the risk factors? Wound healing complications, a high, uh, na high national nosocomial infection surveillance system, and an IS surgical risk score. If you have a malignancy, you're at a higher risk of an infection. If you have a post-op surgical site infection or hematoma, that's obvious. If you've had a prior joint placement of a large prosthesis, prior surgery or infection of a joint or adjacent bone, if you have an infection that's not related to the joint but anywhere in your body, you're at higher risk. As we mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis, and less well-documented risk factors include diabetes, use of steroids, obesity, poor nutrition, older age, hemophilia, sickle cell, and prolonged hospitalization. Now, if we break it down to the risk factors for early onset, you'll see some similarities and differences. Prolonged duration of surgery, the number of operating room personnel, <coughs> inexperienced primary surgeon, advanced age of the patient, rheumatoid arthritis, periop non-articular infections, prior infections, post-op bleeding hematoma, prior surgery on the joint. And that was published in 84 in orthopedic journal. Uh, just to show you, um, if a surgeon is right out of training in the first six months, the infection rate in this one study was seven times an experienced surgeon. And after about six months, the infection rate were comparable to the experienced surgeon. Okay, what about um, some more continued early onset and risk factors? Well, diabetes, we mentioned prolonged hospitalization, so we don't like people to be in the hospital and then go right for their joint surgery. Malnutrition, uh, steroids, and of course we have the rheumatoid arthritis, which would look like this, psoriasis. And if you get a anti-TNF-alpha drug, whether it's for rheumatoid arthritis, other arthritis, inflammatory bowel, GVH, all of these include drugs such as infliximab, indulimab, or sertulzumab, golumumab, okay, and a lot of others. And they work at the T cell macrophage uh, immune response. And the problem is we all know about their opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, PML, and a list of other things. And some of them, such as alemtuzumab, could be up to 10% opportunistic infection. And uh, these are the lists that you may see after these drugs. TB, histo, canada, other mycobacterium, nocardia, etc. And it's usually in the first 0 to 90 days of the drug administration. So <clears throat> what other infections do we worry about? Well, bronchitis, and this is pertinent skin and soft tissue infection. That's pertinent. Bone and joint infections are increased as well as some other sites. So the f skin and bone are a problem. In fact, um, this one study in rheumatology journal found that surgical site infection after orthopedic surgery occurred in 10 out of 91 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Of those 10, 70% of them had an anti-TNF drug. And of the infection-free people, 28 out of 81 were on anti-TNF. So the moral of the story is stop the anti-TNF several weeks prior to orthopedic surgery. Okay, so there's an increased risk when you're assessing it. So how can I try to reduce the risk of a prosthetic joint infection? Well, I could try to shorten the duration of surgery, but that's you know limited. Prophylactic antibiotic within one hour, we're getting better at that. Uh, you could use antibiotic impregnated cement and you can clean and direct your airflow in the OR, make sure it's adequate. You can delay surgery, which has happened until any active infections have resolved and are treated. And of course, taper immunosuppressive therapy. Now, what is the prophylactic antibiotic of choice for prosthetic joint infection? It's cefazolin, uh, preferred over Cefiroxime, it has greater intrinsic activity of staph, narrower side effect profile, lower cost. Vancoclinda have been accepted if you're allergic uh, 
to beta lactams and vanco for MRSA uh, infections, colonizations, those are considered. And then continuing therapy until all these suction drains are removed are deemed to be non necessary. That was published in CID. Now, I just showed you risk factors for early onset. What about late onset? Well, the type of prosthesis, rheumatoid arthritis back on the list, so is non-articular infection. The longer the implant's been in, loosening of the implant, decreased range of motion. All right, here it goes more. Let's get specific and actually look at some articles. So this is in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, looking at knee uh, prosthesis arthroplasty. They looked at 387 surgical site infections requiring reoperations, 43,000 primary and revision total knee replacement, partial complex revision, increased risk of surgical site versus a primary total knee arthroplasty. So the higher risk after primary total knee arthroplasty, men more than females, as we mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis more than osteo, a prior fracture around the knee, a constrained or hinged prosthesis, wound complications, and if it was a total condylar versus unicondylar, that increased your risk. Perioperative IV antibiotics and antibiotics impregnated cement reduced the risk after a revision total knee arthroplasty. How do they present? Pain at implant site occurs in over 90% of cases. Variable includes um, months after surgery with pain, occasionally hematogenous, early onset uh, wound infection. Uh, uh, joint pain, effusion, swelling, redness, tenderness, purulent drainage, sometimes systemic symptoms. The definitive sign, which is not occur commonly, but if you see a sinus tract, that's a giveaway. There's definitely an infection. Uh, and then the early aggressive bugs we mentioned are staph aureus, beta hemolytic strep, and gram negatives. So if you look at three separate studies, you can see that pain dominates, fever is off and on, Swelling is pretty common. Joint drainage, not that common. Sed rate elevation in one study was common. Lucency on the x-ray half the time. Look at the organisms, Staph epi, Staph aureus, Enterococcus, pretty much dominated. So uh, management, early onset, you should debride, retain the prosthesis if possible. If well fixed prosthesis in absence of a sinus tract, remember early onset definition, here's what you should do. Uh, surgical debridement followed by a long course of parental antibiotics is curative in 71% of early onset infections. Delayed onset and late onset, a majority require prosthesis removal. So when you're trying to decide, should I remove the prosthesis or not, try to define early onset from late onset to late onset. De debridement alone is insufficient if the prosthesis is infected as well as loose replacement is required. And that's Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy 2009. Now there's something called DARE. DARE is debridement antibiotics and implant re re retention. And then the journal looked at 112 prosthetic joint infections over five years. 20 or 8 percent recurred during a mean of 2.3 years. Duration of antibiotics was a mean of 1.5 years, long time. Failure was more common after arthroscopic debridement for previously revised joint and for staph aureus infection. So don't mess around with staph aureus, and if it's a revised joint, you have a higher failure rate. Twelve failures occurred after stopping antibiotics, while eight occurred while on antibiotics, which was statistically significant. During the first three months of follow-up, there were eight failures after stopping antibiotics and two while on antibiotics. So again, statistically significant. Duration of antibiotic therapy prior to stopping did not predict outcome. So what are they really saying? Just keep them on antibiotics forever? Well, not necessarily, but remember when you stop antibiotics, you may get a recurrence because now the bug in the biofilm starts to grow and now all of a sudden uh, you've got a recurrent infection. Now, this is a, a JAMA article you should be familiar with, which is the role of rifampin with prosthetic joint infections. They looked at a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind trial conducted from 92 to 97. 18 got cipro-rifampin, 15 got cipro-placebo. 
24 fully completed the trial with a follow-up up to 35 and 33 months. The cure rate was 12, not a big number, but 100%. And the cipro rifampin group compared with 58%, 7 of the 12 in the cipro placebo group, which was statistically significant. 90 of the 33 dropped out due to adverse events, non-compliance, one protocol violation, two, the adverse events were six. Seven of the nine who dropped out were subsequently treated with a rifampin combo, and five of them were cured without removal of the device. So, sounds pretty favorable for rifampin, which is one of the most uh, potent biofilm penetrating drugs, but you never use it alone because resistance rapidly develops. All right, a more common one. This is very fresh. European Journal Clinical Micro 2010. Rifampin for staph prosthetic joint infections. The efficacy and safety of rifampin for staph aureus treated with debridement and retention. 101 patients with staph aureus or coag negative staph were tr treated with the debridement, retention, and antibiotics. 7% or 1 out of 14 of the rifampin treated patients. 32% of the historical rifampin treated patients and 38% of the historical non rifampin failed therapy. The prospective cohort had a lower risk of failed treatment compared to the historical cohort not given rifampin. None of the patients in the prospective study developed hepatotoxicity. The outcome with debridement, retention, and rifampin based regimen was better than a historical cohort treated without rifampin. Was, so this is another article favoring the use of rifampin. So what are the top three organisms recovered from a prosthetic joint infection? What would you say? Any guess? <clears throat> Usually the gram positives, right? So coag negative staph, staph aureus, enterococcus, and the strep. So coag negative staph dominates, staph aureus second, mixed flora, strep come next, intercoccus next, gram negatives are fifth on the list, or sixth, anaerobes, and no organisms. And that was New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, what pathogen is found in shoulder joint infections but rarely in knee and hip due to the more oil glands on your upper body? Have you heard this before? Right, so your choices are here, so you correctly picked Propionobacter, which was published in 2011. So 16% uh, of prosthetic shoulder joint infections, 57% become symptomatic less than 30 days following surgery, 43% become symptomatic after 30 days, favorable outcome if you do surgery and antibiotics. Um, this is debatable, but it tends to be more resistant to vancomycin, but some of the books say it's sensitive. So most people say a penicillin drug would work, um, and carbapenems, I've worked well. Obviously, that's a little overkill, but it works, especially if it's in the brain or CNS. And then um, that was 2005 European Journal there. What's the biggest reason for failure to cure most prosthetic joint infections without prosthesis removal? And the answer is biofilm. So this is what biofilm looks like. This is a cartoon of how biofilm tends to work. And you can see biofilm formation and reattachment and bugs released. And it goes on and on. And you can notice that no antibiotics, white cells can't get in there, and the bug can lay dormant and become quite stationary. So when we think about this, a foreign body will reduce your need of an inoculum by how many logs, you know, greater than 100,000 fold to 100 colony forming units. Um, the glycocalyx coalesces to form a biofilm. Neutrophils can't get in. Organisms become metabolically inactive and resistant. And as I mentioned, antibiotics can't get in. So the antibiotics will potentially improve a joint infection, but then because of bugs and biofilm, it'll relapse days to months later. Your clinical presentation with biofilm kind of organisms can be more indolent, taking weeks to months after surgery. Uh, you could fail long courses of antibiotics without prosthesis removal due to biofilm. 
success of chronic long-term suppression with prosthetic retention. That means you just keep them on for the rest of their life antibiotics and it stays in the biofilm. And then negative culture, if you stick a needle in there, it doesn't grow because it's in the biofilm. So those are all things that biofilm. Now, what's the number one biofilm penetrating antibiotic that everyone always quotes? And the answer is rifampin. But when you look at new drugs, you should find out from whoever you can how well they penetrate. DAPTO actually penetrates quite well. Uh, Tigacycline penetrates well. Quinolones penetrate well, mycofungin, and fluconazole. Uh, there may be a few others, but these are the big biofilm penetrators. Now, what are some strategies to review, reduce surgical site infections after total joint replacement? We talked about the periop. The surgical site prep is very important. Sterile technique, regulating the OR flow of traffic. Antibiotic impregnated bone, controversial, but some people feel it helps. Decolonization before the joint with MRSA. And maybe MSSA is the wave of the future. So that's something to consider. Now, if you look at um, deep total joint infections, surgical site infections, Here's another study quoting numbers from 0.5 to 2%. Their numbers are up to 100,000, three to four more than a total joint replacement, which is 25, 30,000. The infection is 100,000. Uh, the two-stage revision surgery, the first stage is you, inf you remove the infected implant. You put in a cement spacer, whether it's Vanco, Dapto. You give them six to eight weeks of IV antibiotics. The second stage is once their sed rate C-reactive protein normalizes, you may or may not stick a needle in the joint, and then you re-implant the components. That's a two-step procedure. Believe it or not, sometimes amputation is your last resort. This was an old study, but they looked at amputation for control of infection. The three indications were severe bone loss, intractable pain, and multiple failed revision attempts. So this journal in 94 published, looking at 83 to 92, they did nine above knee amputations in eight patients, complications after total knee uh, arthroscopy. The, knee, the mean time from the initial replacement to amputation was 9.7 years. So this was a drawn out period. The average age of the four men and four women was 72 years, so it's the older population. Eight knees uh, were chronically infected. One had intractable pain after four revisions, aseptic loosening. Most had two revisions after the original implant. And the common factors were multiple revision attempts for chronic infection, severe bone loss, and tractable pain, which was the first slide. Now, what about staph aureus and joint infections? Well, um, some people think it causes more than half of total joint arthropo arthroplasty. Uh, 20 to 30 percent of us are colonized in our anterior nares if you swab them. 85 percent come from your endogenous flora, and 83 percent eradication short term can be done with intranasal uh, Bactroban, and Bactroplan applied for five days. Intranasal is what we normally do. And you can significantly reduce the surgical site infection with just Bactroban 2010 article right there. Screening and eradicating MRSA prior to elective orthosurgery, large numbers of people. 95% screen, which is under the 7,000. Now look how common colonization was. 23% had MSSA, 4% had MRSA, 3 of the 309 which was MRSA, and seven of the 5,000 non-carriers developed a surgical site infection. Uh, and then if you compare those, there is statistical significance if you're colonized. Uh, three of the MSSA carriers versus non-carriers did not reach statistical significance. So that would speak against decolonizing MSSA, but it would speak towards decolonizing MRSA. And then 13 of the surgical site infection rate during the study versus 24 of the uh, controls or those who didn't during the control period. Um, statistically significant infection rate, Joan and Boynt's bone and joint surgery 2010. 
So um, that was an interesting period. So when you look at the study period versus the control period, they did see um, that the rate was reduced by doing this Bactra band for these patients. Now, another uh, view, this is interesting, ortho guys love this study, so here it is. Prevalence of staff, they cultured the surgeons and their patients, okay? Then they had 74 attendings and 61 residents. The doctors had a 36% staph aureus colonization and a 1.5% MRSA colonization. Notice the residents, look how high they are. The residents are almost 60% colonized with Staph aureus. None of them had MRSA. And of the 74 attendings, they had more consistent with the general you know, population. But notice they had 2.7% MRSA colonization. And then when they looked at their patients, their patients were less, slightly less MSSA and 2.2% MSSA, so there's question of could your doctor infect you or colonize from their colonization, so that was an interesting finding. Now, if you like cost effectiveness of all this, is it cost effectiveness to do Bactroban to prevent? So there's two strategies. One, let's just, sw let's just treat everybody no matter what. That one you can easily implement. It captures all the false negative MRSA screens but it'll increase your resistance. You can also screen and treat strategy, which is a little harder to implement. Uh, that's what most people do, and it will unfortunately miss false negatives, but then there's less resistance because I'm not doing it to everybody, and then of course you could do no decolonization strategy. So they found that both strategy one and two were cost effective compared to no decolonization strategy. So there is a cost advantage, and that was an infection control journal hot off the press from 2012. Of course, staph affects everybody, and this was a, a famous person who got a staph infection that you may all know. And then the pets, unfortunately. Pets also are getting MRSA staph infections and dying from it, so this is also becoming a veterinarian problem. Now, um, when they've done studies, if you go into a crowded pool, freshwater or even a crowded beach, there's usually tons of MRSA and Staph aureus in the water for several hours until the filtering process or the beach tide washout clears it out. But nobody has ever implicated this as causing infection, but it's just an interesting thought. The Clorox company swabbed all kinds of things, including the laptop or the tops of the trays of your airplane and they found MRSA on it. The uh, railings were full of MRSA. The uh, hotel click, the change the channels are full of MRSA. And as you get heavier and heavier, your MRSA or your Staph aureus colonization goes from 25-30% to 50-60%. So you can t sort of tell over size. And then the more foreign bodies you have, the greater the staph colonization, the more earrings maybe, the more staph colonization. I mentioned already the psoriasis, the scaly skin, high staph colonization. All of us have had little perinicias, which are usually staph, and so the numbers are, in general, 20% are persistent carriers, 60% intermittent, and 20 just never get become carriers. And in general, healthcare workers are not more likely to have MRSA although you can find studies where the um, EMT uh, kind of people in the ambulances and the first response in the ERs may have a higher MRSA colonization than other doctors. And then where can you go in the world with the lowest MRSA rate? Netherlands and Canada are the lowest in the world. Now, let's look at another study hot off the press, clinical infectious disease, a retrospective comparison of rocephin versus oxacillin, looking at staph aureus osteoarticular infection. 52% had hardware, 60% got rocephin, and 40% got oxacillin. The conclusion was oxacillin was more often discontinued due to toxicity, possibly pancytopenia and um, versus less of the ceftriaxone, which was statistically significant, 
and the efficacy was uh, comparable, which is part two. Treatment success at three to six months, 83% ceftriaxone, 86 oxacillin, no, no difference. And after six months, the um, ceftriaxone, oxacillin numbers, again, no difference. So after the IV antibiotics, 45% return received long-term suppression with oral antibiotics in both groups comparable, 50% uh, for the oxygen. So there was no difference. So that was an interesting study giving you other alternatives to oxacillin for bone joint infections such as ANSEF. Now, this always comes up is, do I have to use IV antibiotics for bone joint infections? Could I use oral? Well, we talked about that study that looked at Cipro rifampin. That's an oral drug. Pediatrics commonly uses oral. So there are some cases where you can use oral therapy for serious infections like osteo and joint infections. But you have to know, does it penetrate bone? Do I get good concentrations? Is the patient going to be able to absorb it? Is it sensitive? Is resistance going to develop? There's a lot of questions. And then um, we're in the era of methicillin resistant Staph aureus becoming increasingly resistant, heteroresistant, intermediately resistant to vancomycin. And as that MIC creeps up at the two or higher, you're going to start to see higher failure rates. So it's very important that you pay attention to the MIC when you're treating a MRSA infection. So two or higher is not good. Now, um, one of the other questions is, what about, for example, the rare possibility of a VRE bacteremia? What is the drug of choice? Well, uh, at least in this study, which was 2009, Dapto, Zyvox were pretty much comparable. We tend to shy away from Zyvox for bacteremia because of the static nature, which is true for Staph aureus and endocarditis. But for VRE, they actually are very comparable. So there's your two choices. And then um, what if I uh, start to see now DAPTO-resistant enterococcus? Well, that's been reported now. So the heavy use of DAPTO can promote a VRE becoming DAPTO resistant. So that's another thing to keep in mind, published in 2011. And then um, here's a very interesting question that comes up. What about antibiotic prophylaxis for dental procedures? Here's the quote. So here's what's hard to swallow, but this is it. Dental procedures are not associated with an increased risk of prosthetic joint infection. Use of antibiotic prophylaxis prior to a dental procedure does not alter the risk of subsequent total hip or total knee arthroplasty. There's been 25 reported cases of a late onset prosthetic joint infection after a dental procedure. The association be the, to, between the dental treatment and the prosthetic joint was purely circumstantial. There is no experimental observation suggesting a link between bacteremia induced from a dental source and a prosthetic joint infection. So if you have a prosthetic joint, you go to the dentist, a lot of people prophylax them, but you need to know the science isn't there. Okay, and what is the science? Well, if you really look into this, the American Urologic Association and the American Academy of Orthopedics say that patients with a prosthetic joint who undergo a urologic procedure do not need antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent bacteremia with possible seeding of the joint. Prophylaxis can be considered if they're immune suppressed, undergoing a higher risk procedure of bacteremia such as lithotripsy or surgery involving bowel segments. And that was also the American Society of GI Endoscopists said they issued guidelines against the use of antibiotic prophylaxis prior to GI endoscopy in patients with a prosthetic joint association. So there's, there's statements there that you don't have to use antibiotics. So there's other organizations saying you do, so it's up to you to decide the risk. But in general, you don't need to. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this talk was about prosthetic joint infection, infections plus some miscellaneous others. So what do you think the infection is on this one? Where's the hot spot in the joints or the bones? Any guess? That's a sternoclavicular joint septic arthritis forming a phlegmon mass.
osteomyelitis, as you can see there, developing may spread to the mediastinum into the cavity. Notice the um, fibrocartilaginous joint of that space. So if you stick a needle in there, you're not going to get any fluid out. So that's point one. Also point two is the veins lay right behind that joint with no tissue separating them. So whatever is traveling in the veins can easily seed that area. So you can see how tight and close that sternoclavicular joint is to the major veins. That's why people shooting up in their necks were seeding the joint. So IV drug use was one of the risk factors as well as central lines lying right in that area. So if you look at uh, sternoclavicular joint septic arthritis, the mean age is 45, males dominate, chest pain, shoulder pain, the duration of symptoms about 14 days, fever, common, bacteremia, pretty common, IV drug use quarter of the time, diabetes, trauma, central line, other risk factors. Osteomyelitis occurs in over half of them. They could get a chest wall abscess phlegmon in a quarter, mediastinitis in 13%. The dominating bug is Staph aureus pseudomonas was the big one that made a lot of press, but it's been declining since the 80s. Uh, it only makes up 1% of all septic arthritis, but in IV drug users, it makes up 17% of septic arthritis. Now, here's another case. You tell me the diagnosis. Recurrent bone lesions. A 17-year-old white female left femur osteomyelitis two years ago. Culture negative, resolves with no treatment. Now she's back in right femur, the opposite leg, is osteomyelitis, negative cultures, histopath, no malignancy, but acute inflammation. What's your diagnosis? Any guess? Because you're going to get these cases. Okay, this is chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. It's more common in children and adolescents, occasionally adults. It's the usually the metaphysis, the long bone, spine, pelvis, shoulder girdle. It's a one in one million incident, so it's not that common. The treatment is NSAID steroids, bisphosphonate, azulfidine, and infliximab. It's thought to be due to an autoimmune attack of the bone. And yes, it can mimic osteomyelitis as well as osteoid, osteoma, sarcoma, and histiocytosis. And then finally, when we're talking about wound infections, don't forget the famous pedicure infections. And um, bad outcomes. So these are the rapidly growing mycobacterium, Chelonia fortuitum, abscessus. They grow within a week. They're in the surface water, soil, tap water, and iatrogenic infections are occurring. And they develop sometimes even after inhalation, surgery, central lines, disseminating in the immunosuppressed. Uh, some of the studies show rapidly growing mycobacterium after breast surgeries are quite common. If you want a quick review of the outbreaks, Nail Salon, M. fortuitum, 61 patients, 170 days duration, mean disease, uh, four months of antibiotics on average, Cipromino was used mostly, and the earlier you diagnose, the shorter the treatment. One did disseminate lymphatic. Another outbreak with a foot bath, M. fortuitum, 110 patients, boils range from 1 to 37 with a median of 2. Shaving the legs with a razor before the pedicure was a risk factor. New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, liposuction. There was a famous outbreak with um, lipotourism to Dominican Republic. Eight healthy females uh, had abdominal liposuction, developed infection, a median of seven weeks with painful red sub-Q nodules. Two of eight were correctly diagnosed, seven INDs, combos with macrolides, sufoxin, and amipenem, amicase, and zyvox, all but one occurred after a median of nine months, so a long course, CID. Another one, illicit soft tissue injection at a party using hyaluronic acid, two sub-Q nodules on the face and buttocks. M. abscessus was the culprit, cured with biaxin and prednisone. Dermatology Journal. Uh, breast implants, 14 confirmed non tuberculous infections, 14 possible, one probable. Out of 492 breast implants in a Brazil at 12 hospitals, all different genotype except Hospital C may have had a local outbreak. No risk factors identified.
Uh, another patient isolated case reports a breast reconstruction flap, recurrent abscesses around the flap, debridement, second reconstruction, and that was published in a plastic surgery journal. One more, breast augmentation, 48 days later, pain, swelling of the breast, M. I grew from the aspirate in a plastic surgery journal published. And then, of course, facelifts, those are called rhytidectomies, and they had an outbreak at a surgical center. Four patients with M. Chelonii contaminated methylene blue used as a tissue marking agent published in 2004. And then here at our own hospital, we have a number of mycobacterium from sputum blood, bronchoscopies, skin and soft tissue, breast, uh, from fortuitum abscessus chelonii. Um, and then one cancer center looked at 115 cases over five years and they found abscessus fortuitum mucogenicum dominated. Abscessus like the lungs more, mucogenicum like the central line bloods. And uh, all of the blood infections were cured with line removal and antibiotics. And then of course this is what your lungs look like when you have a rapidly growing mycobacterium infection in the lungs. And then, of course, we have to consider the community-acquired MRSA with the PVL-positive infection treated with um, various antibiotics like Doxy, Septra, Zyvox, Dapto, Vanco, and the PVL-positives gives you higher mortality if it's in your lung than a PVL-negative strain. And then all the sports and um, people that um, have close contact daycares may be at higher risk. Uh, Clindus, quinolones work better than, say, the hospital-acquired strain. Clinda resistance is a rising problem when we're thinking about that, as opposed to the real spider bite, which is the brown recluse has a violin or fiddle on its back. This is what happens after a brown recluse spider bite. And uh, over time, it can become quite necrotic. Okay, so the toxin causes lots of... Um, necrosis and even though it doesn't show up in Florida it's actually found in Florida and then of course bite wounds this cat's about to bite the child as well as big cats and remember finger bites are really bad because you can puncture the tendon sheath and that's pastorella which is very virulent causes cellulitis within a day cats are worse than dog bites Dog bites also have 60% uh, pastorella, uh, and then capnocyte aphasia can get in there if you have no spleen, canamorsis. Uh, and then um, this is a dog bite, and there's the gram-negative rod of capnocyte aphasia, canamorsis. Um, clenched fist injury from a human mouth, besides anaerobes, anaerobic strep, think of Iconella. And Iconella is one of the Haysack bugs, if you remember that, the E in Haysack. And then um, remember, adults more likely to be infected after a bite than a child, cat more than a dog. Don't forget the monkey bites are a little unique because you have to prophylax with Famvir, Valtrex, or Acyclovir because they can cause encephalitis due to herpes simia or herpes B six to eight weeks later. We've actually had rat bites in the lab and that can cause rat bite fever. Most commonly is Streptobacillus monoliformis, and in Asia it's Spirillia minor, and you want to use the penicillin doxycycline. Uh, rarely alligator bites, freshwater, leeches, think of Aramonas, mud football, anything in mud, think of Aramonas. And then snake bites, no one's really studied the pathogens, but if you think about it, snakes swallow animals head first. What's in the stool of animals? You might want to think of some gram negatives getting in there, in addition to all the other bugs, plus the toxins. And then this was a missionary guy that went to Bangladesh in, uh, several years ago. There's him and his family going to Bangladesh. He's an orthopod. And here he is um, working with the patients. And guess what he saw? Tons of osteomyelitis, trauma, skin and soft tissue infections. Why? Because they crowd people in cars when they flip over. You got mass casualty, broken bones. So orthopedics is tons of that stuff is seen over there in Bangladesh.
And then finally in the Amazon, this is the world's largest rodent, the capybara. It looks like a giant rat running around the house. And then if you go to Tibet, that's the yak for the local animals there. Thank you for your attention, and hopefully we all learned something about prosthetic joint infections.